Hey everybody, it's Pastor Troy, and welcome to another edition of our online church. I just wanna remind you, church is not a place to go to, it's a mission to join. And thank you for being part of that mission. I'm doing well, my family's doing well, I hope you guys are doing well. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I wanna encourage you, stay connected with God, do your spiritual practices with God. We are under an order to shelter in place, and in Psalm 91, verse one, he says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And so I love this kind of sheltering into or under God. And so we hope you're doing that. Read your Bible, pray, listen to God, take some moments of silence, do those things. The second thing we'd encourage you is stay connected. There's so many ways to stay connected. I'm in this room that we built for connections where we run into each other and we talk and we have what we call fellowship. Uh, we can do this. There's ways to call people, connect with them, uh, use Zoom, love me some Zoom, and just connect with people that we often ran into. I would say this, connect with somebody that you're a friend with, but also pray about somebody maybe randomly to connect with and share life and look at them on the screen and talk with them. Ask them how you can pray for them. Ask them how you can uh, be connected and, and what you can do for them. There's ways we can serve each other. Next thing, uh, online giving. We thank you for giving. Again, church is not a place to go to, it's a, it's a mission to become part of. And you can help us continue our mission. We're still doing our mission, we're still serving, we're looking at ways to help those. And there's gonna be a lot of people in need. And when you give to the church, we're gonna have resources to help people in need. You know our phrase, we're in the community for the community. And throughout this and when this is over, we're, we want the church to be a, a lighthouse and just be able to pour out support and help. And continue to stick with us with our devotionals and our 21 days of prayer and just all our announcements because those are ways that we're gonna share our mission and ways that we can get involved and maybe even some volunteer opportunities. Final thing, Easter's coming next week. I bought this shirt at a resale shop in Chicago and said I can't wait to wear this on Easter. One of my favorite things about Easter is the dressing up. Uh, and men wear pastels and women wear dresses and I'm not a big dress up person but I really do love when we dress up for Easter. It celebrates new life and hope. And that was one of the things that maybe you're like, ah, oh, that's a bummer, we dress up and we go to church. Well, here's a way. We're gonna do a Easter best dressed outfit and it's really just get together with your family, uh, get dressed, take a picture and then tag us on Facebook or Instagram now there's some other instructions here. Send via Facebook or Instagram message, email image to hello at freshwatercc.org. So that's some ways that we can see your family. We'll post those and then after our service on Easter, you can scroll through and see all the different people. Remind you to pray for people, how much you love the people of our church and, and just enjoy that. And here's one other thing about Easter and I can't give it to you right now, but later this week, probably on Wednesday, and I believe around six, uh, be looking for this. We'll have some information leading up to it. I have a great announcement about Easter. We're gonna do something really special and really cool we've been working on that uh, I think will excite us, connect us, uh, celebrate Easter in a unique way. Uh, just gonna, gonna leave you there with a kind of a cliffhanger on that one, but we're excited. We're gonna go to worship and we are then gonna go to some preaching and I hope that you're blessed. And just remember this, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds our future, right? So let's just cling to that truth. Let me pray real quick. God, thank you. Thank you that you hold our future. Thank you that this did not surprise you. Thank you that you have a good plan for us, that you can use this to refine us, to grow us, to deepen our faith. And God, thank you there's still so many blessings in our lives. There's so many things that we can hold on to, so many beautiful, wonderful things. And God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you that when he went away, he said he went away to prepare a place and that he's gonna come back for us. God, we also pray that you would protect our nation, our world. God, that you would enable some kind of cure, 
some kind of treatment. And God, that you would use this, that people would draw close to you and that we would pray, God, and that you would heal our world. And God, that people would see it's from your hand, the divine nature of your rescue in this moment. And we pray, God, also for very close, uh, instead of the big picture of the world, our lives, our homes. We pray, God, that you would put your grace in our homes, that we'd have sweet conversations with our families. And God, we'd be able to stay connected and we'd create new ways and new memories that God, your church, would sense your strength in this time. And we pray this in your name. God bless, amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. How great 
thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art He took my sins and my 
sorrows He made them His very own He bore the burden of Calvary And suffered and died alone How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Well, hello, Freshwater family. My name's Colin, one of the pastors here at the church, and glad to be with you today and excited to bring you the message in our third week of our series, Encouraging Words for Challenging Times, a series where we strategically crafted in the midst of our challenging times as a culture with the coronavirus and the lockdown and, and all that that means for our world, but also uh, for us personally, and considering the ways that we can, as a church, encourage one another. So that's what we've been doing. The first week we covered the topic of hope. Last week we talked about peace, and this week we're going to be talking about uh, the provision of God. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me. In, in the midst of the lockdown, however it's altered your life, myself and the staff have been working from home a lot more uh, recently. And, and one of the effects that's had on my life is last week or the week before, I, I honestly can't remember, it was Thursday and I thought it was a Tuesday or it was Tuesday and I thought it was a Thursday. I don't really remember what it was. Uh, but if it's affected you, this lockdown's affected you in that way, I, I don't want to freak you out, uh, but today is Sunday. And it's not just any Sunday, it's Palm Sunday, uh, which is kind of a big day in the church. If you grew up in the church, and even if you didn't grow up in the church, you might be aware of this. Sunday takes place the week before Easter, which we're, we're gearing up for this coming week in our Good Friday and, and Easter gatherings, which we're really excited for. Um, but the Palm Sunday story is a very, very fascinating story that in a few moments I'm excited to just kind of tell you the story of Palm Sunday. And you might be wondering how, is there any encouraging words that have to do with the provision of God in Palm Sunday, especially considering the, the challenging times that we face in life? And I think upon a deeper look at the story, we will find, I think, great significance in understanding more deeply the provision of God that I think can be applied in our hearts and in our lives and in any challenging season that we might face. 
Now in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, these four books cover the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And all four books combined, one third of their focus is on the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus lived 33 years, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 33%, one third of their content is focused on the last week of Jesus' life. And it all starts with Palm Sunday. So why is this moment so significant? Why do we take time every year as a church, the week before Easter, to acknowledge this moment, the week before Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead? What is so significant about Palm Sunday? Well, allow me a moment to tell you about Palm Sunday. So here's the thing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Jesus did so many things. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all cover different aspects of the same story we call the gospel message. It's not that they contradict one another, it's just that Jesus did so many dynamic things and God in his divine wisdom provided us this, this beautiful blend of these four books that give an account of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. Things in Matthew and Luke, like the Christmas story, you don't find in Mark and John, and there's parables and healings that some cover, but here's what's neat about Palm Sunday, is this is recorded in all four Gospels, this moment where Jesus, what your Bibles might call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, I'd love to tell you to turn to your Bibles and follow along, but here's the reality. I'm going to be bouncing between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in this story because each Gospel is telling different aspects of the story that I really don't want to miss as, as much as I can. And again, considering the encouraging words of God's provision in this story. Uh, but to really understand Palm Sunday, you, you have to know some of the events that led up to it, and especially the events that happen after this takes place. So Jesus at this point in his ministry, it's coming to an end. It's actually a week from ending because we know that Jesus ends up dying on the cross several days after this moment. Jesus has been ministering for three years with the disciples, and everything Jesus does is successful. I mean, you want to see success in its purest form, look at Jesus. Greater than any organization or business or church or ministry or nonprofit, whatever, Jesus has a 100% success rate. And what that means then is, well, he accumulated quite the popular, popularity in following with everything that he did. Just recently on his way to Jerusalem, before this moment that we're going to talk about, he's passing through Jericho. He just heals some blind men. Perfectly. He, he converts a sinful tax collecting man named Zacchaeus. He actually even recently heals a friend of his named Lazarus who died and had been dead for four days from his sickness. He rises him from the grave and there were people there who had seen this. Jesus is creating quite the following and causing a considerable amount of intrigue in the people of this area at this time. And so here he is, him and his disciples, at a small town called Bethpage outside Jerusalem, getting ready for what we know as Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Now this is unprecedented. So far in Jesus' ministry, you see often he would heal someone or forgive someone of their sins in he would tell them to not tell anyone. He's kind of been secretive to some degree. Now, the reason for that is a sermon for another day, but he's been doing that nonetheless. So his disciples might be a little weirded out at what they see Jesus preparing for because this is the Passover weekend. Easter weekend is the weekend of the Passover, the most famous Jewish celebration holiday and ceremony in the Jewish religion. And it's no coincidence, well fine, I'll come back to this in a little bit, it's no coincidence that Jesus is choosing this moment to do such a significant thing like this triumphal entry that precedes only days later his death and his resurrection. Now I'll start this story in John chapter 12 where it says, when the crowd heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And they began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, people heard that Jesus was coming, and so they went out to meet him, and they began to shout that most famous Palm Sunday word, Hosanna, which is a plead for salvation, like someone would beg in need of salvation, blessed is he, Jesus, who comes 
in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And after this moment, Jesus does something really peculiar, uh, somewhat cryptic. Uh, he instructs the disciples to go to a nearby town and immediately they would find a, a donkey and tied to it would be the donkey's child, which is called a colt. And, and Luke even says that the donkey had been unridden, which means unbroken. It says this in Matthew, uh, the disciples bringing this donkey to Jesus, it says this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And here's what's really important about something that Jesus is doing, why I'm talking about provision today is that Jesus is fulfilling something very important on this day. He says, behold, your king, speaking of himself, is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, right now you're thinking of that crappy uh, Rolling Stones song, Beast of Burden, I apologize. But nonetheless, that's what the colt was often signified as, a beast of burden, a colt carried stuff. What I want to remark on here is this, is Jesus is preparing for his coronation ceremony, right? We see this all throughout history, kings and queens and even presidents still today, when they assume their position of power, there's a ceremony that takes place. What does Jesus, the king of kings, provide for himself? A cult. That's it. A cult. Where, where most people would expect a, a person of royalty to ride in on a royal steed, most often a white horse. Horses we take into battle, a sign of strength. Colts are used to carry things. It's a sign of humility. Now notice the great humility of Jesus, our King, the King of Kings. This is, Palm Sunday is, listen, the greatest coronation ceremony for the greatest being of all time, past, present, and future in all of the universe. Palm Sunday is describing that. Our King has come. Now compare that to all of the coronation services you've seen with our King and Queens throughout history. The contrast in pride and humility, the humility of our Lord on a cult, but the wild separation in his kingship in comparison to all kings and queens and presidents all throughout history. This great humility, though, does not discourage the crowds, and they're overjoyed to see Jesus marching into Jerusalem. In Luke, it says that the whole crowd, not just 12 disciples, but the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully, and not just joyfully, but with a loud voice, it says, for all the miracles which they had seen. In the Gospel of John, it actually describes that people who were there when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, they were actually at Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry, telling people, testifying about all the things that Jesus had done, and similar to what they've already been chanting, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory, in the highest. So what an amazing moment to see. But then there's always the Pharisees to ruin the party. Sure enough, there were Pharisees in the crowd. It says, they said to Jesus, and they don't address him as king or he who comes in the name of the Lord. No, they address him as just a teacher. And they say, they rebuke him, telling him to rebuke his disciples. Now, I love what Jesus says, the audacity and boldness that Jesus has to kind of rebuke them back. He says, I tell you, Pharisees, uh, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It's kind of a reference to Psalm 148, that all created things, even inanimate objects, will praise God. And Jesus is applying this to himself, clearly solidifying, though somewhat misunderstood by the crowds, acknowledged correctly enough that Jesus is the king. He is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David, the Messiah. And if they keep quiet, well, the stones will cry out. This is the Palm Sunday story. Now there's more to it and I encourage you on your own this week as we build up to Good Friday and Easter to read it on your own at some point and read back through it because there, there's more to it than that. But I wanna start asking now, what is the significance of this story and what does it have to do in the way of it being an encouraging word for us in challenging times uh, while considering God's great provision? And there's a lot there that if you miss it, I'm gonna go back through some of that here 
in a moment. Because as I read through this story over and over and over through all four Gospels, there's a lot that stuck out to me in Jesus' humility and the crowd's complete misunderstandings, the hatred of the Pharisees, imagining what the disciples are doing while nervous but still excited that their ministry with Jesus is gaining a lot of momentum and success. What is the takeaway uh, from this story? Well, as we seek to encourage you today, again, building up towards Easter, here's what I want to encourage you with is this, is that God's provision becomes clear the more we persevere. What if I told you that no one in this whole story Clearly not the Pharisees, not even the crowds who are joyfully exclaiming and proclaiming Hosanna to Jesus, the King of Israel, not even his 12 disciples have a clue of what's going on here. It's not clear to anyone, though they, some of them think it's clear. I mean, the Pharisees are very confident in in their own clarity that God is not providing Jesus as the coming king for Israel. They feel very confident in that, and they tell Jesus that. The crowds are chanting Hosanna to the king of Israel. They feel very clear that Jesus is being provided by God, but their clarity has led them to think that, well, Jesus is there to deliver them from Rome. You see, at this time, the Jewish people were very oppressed by the Roman government. It was a very paganistic culture and oppressed the Jewish religion in a number of ways. And the Jews, somewhat superficially at this moment in history, just sought uh, delivering f- deliverance from the Roman Empire. That's not why Jesus came. That's not why God the Father has provided Jesus Christ the Son to come. And so although they thought it was clear and they were so excited, they were still misunderstood. And even the 12 disciples we see moments after this moment, several days upon Jesus' arrest, they even run scared. There's a lot of cloudiness, not clarity surrounding this moment. It seems like there's a lot of clarity. There's a lot of joy. The Pharisees seem confident. The crowds seem confident. Who knows what the disciples think? Jesus is the only one who really knows what's going on. And everything that Jesus does is is, is meticulous. It's not random. It's all purposeful. It's all provision. So where does the perseverance come in? Now, a a few quick disclaimers on this. When when I say that God's provision becomes clear, the, the more we persevere, this is not like a health and wealth in any sort of way or a guarantee that you will understand in some way of enlightenment God's provision in a perfect sense. I believe, and I'm a testimony of having experienced moments in my life, challenging times where I've persevered, and on the other side of that challenging time, I've I've seen the clarity of what God was doing all along. And we've seen this a lot in our lives. And here we are, we know the whole story. We know what happens after Palm Sunday. So why is Palm Sunday happening in the first place if we know something even greater is to come, the crucifixion and death of Jesus, and most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus? Well, God's provision is God's provision. And we leave that to Him. The question for us today is, well, how do we persevere in the hopes of seeing the clarity of God's provision through all the challenging times. This is how we hope to encourage you today considering God's provision in this story because trust me, there is so much provision happening in this story despite the clarity, whether people understand or don't understand. And I believe that's even true for the challenging times that we face today. I believe there's principles of faith and what we can know about God that can be applied very greatly to our challenging times still today that the disciples and even the crowds faced at this time in history. Well, let me do this really quick. Let me clarify our terms for a brief moment. What do I mean when I say provision? What what is God's providence? And and for some of us, this is somewhat self-explanatory, but I'm going to jump to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. And I kind of reworded it in a way for us to understand where it says, providence is God is working all things according to his purposes. Here's what I believe. And this might seem like a strange encouragement, 
But it should, it should provide us far more comfort than confusion to know that this remains no matter what's happening, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we love it or hate it, I believe God is providentially working all things, all things according to not just randomness, but a purpose that God has. And I believe that's happening in the story of Palm Sunday. Jesus is working all things in that moment according to God's purpose. All right, so where does perseverance come in? Now listen, perseverance, I believe, is actually not far off from our definition of providence. I believe it's, it's not just as simple as knowing that this is, this, knowing this is happening is not enough for a strong and productive and, and growing faith in God. It's not just knowing this, that's part of it, but it's trusting this. Perseverance is trusting that God is working all things according to his purposes. Look, Kyle, that's easy for you to say, but you have no idea what I'm going through right now. How can you say that I just need to trust through this challenging time that God is working all things according to his purposes. And I'm just here to tell you that I'm someone who has gone through those before. And I know a lot of you have as well. And we're going to use a few biblical stories in addition to the Palm Sunday story to maybe understand this a little better. But if the definition of providence is God is just working anything and everything according to his purposes, well, perseverance is through whatever season. Once the coronavirus is over and we're on to our next challenging time, this is still going to be the encouraging word. Trust through all seasons that God is working all things according to his purposes. And, and as we persevere, I, I truly believe that in some ways we will have more clarity of God's provision. Let me illustrate this to you in my own life. Uh, with my own daughter and, and appeal to you parents and even you kids because we've all been kids at one point not all of us have been parents but we understand this relationship and it's a relationship that God uses to illustrate often uh, some clarity that he can bring to the kind of relationship that we have with him as a heavenly father with our own kids and our own parents sometimes now in this season of lockdown you might have had more time in your hands like my wife and I have and uh projects might be coming into your mind. What, what can I do with this extra time uh, on my hands? And so my wife and I finally felt like we had to deal with that uh, garage of ours. And uh, it, it got to the point where we might as well have put hazard tape over the door and just not let anyone in there because I'm not even sure what's in there at this point. No, it wasn't that bad. But we realized, okay, we have some time on our hands. Let's just, let's just get at the garage. And so, of course, we like to do things together as a family. We invite our kids to help, a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And kids helping is actually kids not helping. Uh, but it's good for you to do as a parent is invite your kids to help and, and help them understand the quality and, and, and the principle of hard work uh, through whatever you're asking them to do and for them to trust you through whatever you're asking them to do that what you're asking them to do is a good thing for them to obey and to do. Well, I back the van out of the garage and I just stand in amazement at the mess of our garage. And we've all been there. And my daughter immediately grabs the broom and, and starts sweeping and just kicking up dust. And, and I, I tell her, honey, we, we can't do that yet. We, we got to clear everything out. There's, there's your bikes. There's this trash. I don't even know where it came from. Uh, there's these tools of mine laying around. There's just all this stuff laying around. We can't sweep yet. There's a process to getting this garage clean. And though she knows that the garage clean is the outcome, what that exactly looks like in the process to get there for me, a father, to get into a six-year-old brain was quite the challenge sometimes. And so I try to instruct her, just trust me, and, and here, take this bucket and take it out to the driveway. And in here, pull this bike out and set it over here and take this hammer and set it on the table and take this back. And all these instructions, and my daughter even asks us, she even tells me at one point, Dad, you're making a bigger mess. I'm like, oh, thanks. Thanks for the update that I'm making a bigger mess. I, you clearly don't know the process of this. And, and I get it. I get her vantage point what's happening there there's no clarity in her mind and here's what starts to happen the perseverance starts to go my wife's landscaping in the yard somewhere and i turn around to ask my daughter to carry something else out and she left me she abandoned me i'm all by myself now cleaning the garage i finally get everything out of the garage the kids come back and help me sweep and they go off again and i finally get everything organized everything swept put back where it's supposed to go and there's this really 
really this, this moment that it was a, a very telling of our own human nature, even as adults, but still as children of God, that helped me realize something about this. My daughter walks back into the garage and everything's done. She helped a little bit. And she's standing in amazement at the majesty of daddy's work and being able to clean up the garage and, and all of my capabilities. I might not be able to do much, but I can clean a mean garage. And uh, anyways, she's standing there and it was really cute and kind of even silly, uh, her amazement and how she even expressed it. Like, Daddy, you did such a good job. I can't believe how clean this garage is. And what I'm realizing in that moment is her father, is she didn't understand my provision in this moment. And, and with that, the required process of how to get to my ideal outcome, her as her father, what I've planned for this moment, the most ideal outcome, the clean garage, and the most ideal process to get a clean garage. And here's what I wanted to tell her, and I did tell her. As I told her, Braylon, I just need you to trust me. You kept walking off and you kept quitting and you kept abandoning me. You, you didn't persevere through all of the commands that I gave you as your father. You, you, you walked away because you didn't have a clarity or you didn't agree with the vision in the first place. You didn't agree with the process. You didn't understand the intended outcome. Most of the problem lies in her trust, not in her clarity. And perseverance is one of the greatest expressions of trust. See, what, what I hope to do here is, is to expand your mind on the idea of what God's provision is far beyond just needing provisions for shelter and food and money and a job. That, that's great, and God can provide for those things. And not just perseverance in the really, really tough times, but perseverance that, that trusts God in times where you have absolutely no answers at all. But the goal is to stand back, not just so you have some higher level of enlightenment of what God's doing, but it leads you to greater worship in the moment you see what God's done in your life through a challenging time. And then it leads you to greater trust the next time most assuredly challenging times will come again and again. The first point I wanna make in addition to this is this, God's provision is beyond our perception. I'm gonna try and make this point as quick as I can. And this might sound like, Colin, I, I thought this was uh, encouraging words for challenging times. You're telling me there's limitations. I, I don't feel encouraged. But the word encourage means to give courage, not to give warm, fuzzy, happy feelings. I would love for you to feel warm and happy and fuzzy. But what I really care about more than that is that you would feel a sense of courage within your heart and soul and encouragement and for us to get a place where we are persevering through challenging times, really and heavily dependent upon God, what you notice in the Palm Sunday story, no one had a clue what was going on. It actually says early on in the part where Jesus instructed his disciples to get the cult. Remember that part of the story? What does it say here? At first, his disciples did not understand. It was beyond their perception. They didn't understand all of this. It actually says back in Luke before, Jesus even told the disciples, we're gonna go to Jerusalem and I'm gonna suffer many things at the hands of the religious leaders. I'm even gonna die. And even there it says the disciples did not understand. But listen, God's provision is beyond our perception. That doesn't mean it's unattainable. There are levels of God's provision in our lives that we we will never comprehend. I, I can guarantee you that. But there are some levels and expressions of his provision that I believe we, we can comprehend and experience at times. It was after Jesus was glorified that they realized that these things had been written about him. There was truth that existed that they had access to in the Old Testament. I've just referenced some of it. You see, you saw it littered throughout the whole Palm Sunday story. There's, there's prophecies of Daniel 9 the disciples had access to, I, uh, Zechariah 9 that the disciples had access to, references to Psalm 148 and Psalm 8 and Psalm 118 that is all referenced by Jesus himself and the crowds who are crying, Hosanna. All of this had been written about Jesus, but only after Jesus was glorified did they understand. There was enough perseverance, though the disciples ran scared. There was enough perseverance that eventually they did realize. And what do we see that led to? Well, the disciples, they gave their lives to spread the gospel message. 
once they realized these things. And, and in our lives still today, I mean, we have the gospel message in its entirety. How blessed are we today? But this still happens in challenging times. At first, we don't always understand what God is up to, but we are to press on just like the disciples did. And there's going to be moments where we understand what Jesus is up to. Now, there's something I want to encourage you before I move on from this point that Jesus references that I think is applicable as we consider that analogy of the relationship we have with our parents on earth because Jesus uses this analogy to encourage the kind of faith we should have. He says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. There's an adaptation, not necessarily in our actions, but first in our minds that should take place. Think of a child. Well, what is a child? What is the difference between us and children? As adults, there's a lot of differences. In some ways, we should be jealous of our children, seeing the innocence that they have. They are humble in nature. They are deeply dependent on their parents and guardians to lead them into goodness. They quickly, children, they've done studies that show children quickly adapt to things that are good and they respond well to things that are good. They thrive in, in, in simple order, in structure, in life. There's so many things we could go down a long list of things, but most notably is the humility of a child and the trusting nature of a child. And without that, there will be a huge obstruction to being a part of the kingdom of God. We need to revert in our faith back to a childlike state in our humility and trust in God to admit that his provision, our heavenly father's provision is beyond our perception of time. Not that at some point we can't understand it, but to enter into these challenging times with the understanding and the hopes of having clarity. I don't know how this coronavirus is going to end. Pastors all over the world have already claimed that this might be a judgment on certain groups of people. What arrogance and foolishness to, to, to jump to and think that they somehow have this enlightenment of what, of what God is doing in any level of clarity to claim what that is, and it's not even over yet. We're just two, three, four weeks into this thing in our own country now and experiencing it. I don't know what God's provision means for each individual person within all of this. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us have kept our jobs. Some of us might be challenged in our relationships and in what's happening at home, a whole host of things. But like a child, accept the reality that God's provision at this time is beyond your perception, but that let, let that lead you to perseverance with a childlike faith. The next point I want to make is very similar to this one. And it's that God provides despite our perception. God provides despite our perception and even our ability to provide for ourselves. Just like me as a parent, when, when my daughter left my presence and she stopped helping me clean, I, I didn't go out to my wife and say, hey, Braylon won't help me clean the garage anymore. If she's not doing it, I'm not doing it. No, that's what bad parents do. I didn't, of course I didn't do that. That's not what fathers do. That's not what our heavenly father does. That's not what providence is described as in how we understand God. As his children, God provides despite our perception. Just like you as a parent provide for your child despite their ability to know. You make them lunch, not because they know you made them lunch, but because you know that they need provision for their life to be sustained. And it's not based on their perception or ability of it. I'd encourage you to read Romans chapter 8. In, in this chapter, the Apostle Paul, the writer here, captures so well the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father as His children and describes it in the context of sufferings. And the honorable mention I'll give you for now is this. He says that you, you, as a child of God, received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And just pause for a moment and consider the gracious kindness of God to provide us access to him in every weakness and challenging time to cry out to him no matter where we are, no matter how far we've gone, no matter how dark we are in our hearts, we can cry out, Abba, Father. 
And as he goes on to explain, it kind of culminates to this realization. Now notice the two challenges I'm giving to you, they actually are perceptions. Though God's provision is beyond our perception, and he provides despite our perception, there's still a perception within how God has designed our minds where we can perceive things. Here, Paul describes it in verse 28. We know. We perceive. What we can know through all challenging times. What God has provided is a perception that we can have as his children that he causes by his provision all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. Now, that is a brainful right there, but I don't want us to miss what, what is going on. Our perception that God is causing everything in our lives, as hard as that can be to comprehend sometimes, but listen, here's what I don't want to miss, to work together for good. That for good is determined by God, not by you. And as I draw to a closing, here's what I want you to consider as well. This, this is, I think, fascinating. It's no coincidence that Jesus on Palm Sunday is showing up the week of the Passover. Short version of this Passover celebration is an annual uh, feast and ceremony where the Jews would every year provide an atonement for their sins, sins uh, a, a sacrifice of a lamb. And so that's what everyone's doing. And in fact, the moment that Jesus enters, this triumphant entry is right around the time that most people, these hundreds of thousands of people are getting, making the arrangements for their selected lamb for them and their household to provide the atonement sacrifice for their sins. This is because of what God did in delivering the Israelites, the Jews, from captivity under the Egyptians. And everyone who spread, remember, the, the blood of the lamb on their door frame, well, the angel of death that passed through the land of Egypt would pass over that home. And God then gave a statute to continue to honor that miracle and provision that he made back then. You might see how this is working together. We'll go back even farther beyond the Israelites' enslavement under the Egyptians. There's a man named Abraham. And it kind of starts here. This picture of the sacrifice of a lamb starts with Abraham. In fact, the first time we see the word provision, provide, in the Bible, the first time this word shows up is in Genesis chapter 22 with the man Abraham and the story of him and his son Isaac. Another illustration of the relationship of a father and his son. God gives Abraham a very strange instruction. Hey, he tells him to take his only son, Isaac, and offer him as a sin sacrifice up on Mount Moriah. Now, Abraham and Sarah are very, very old in their age, and they struggle to have kids, and Isaac right now is their only kid, and God's told Abraham that he's going to make a great nation through his seed. How on earth are you going to kill my only child, Jesus, or God, if, if, if I have to sacrifice and give his life up? That's not how Abraham's mind worked. He's a human just like all of us with the limitations of perception. And, and, and this is a story right now where Abraham had a limited perception of what God was doing in this moment. But he had perseverance. Did he disobey? No, he obeyed God. He took his only son. Though Isaac didn't know what was happening, he let his son Isaac know that they were going up to the mountain to give a sin sacrifice. So up they go, Mount Moriah. And Isaac finally asks his father, where is the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? This is what Abraham says. And this is the first time you see the word provide. He says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Talking to his son, assuring him of the provision that will come by God this confidence, this trust. When he, he has no perception of what God, he has no understanding of what, how God's provision, when God's provision is going to happen. He just has simple confidence that it's going to happen. When? Don't know. How? Don't know. But God will provide for himself the lamb. God hasn't provided a lamb yet. So what does Abraham do? Abraham puts his son on the altar, binds him to the altar, raises a blade 
ready to obey and persevere through what God's called him to do obediently. And in that moment of great faith, an angel of the Lord calls Abraham to stop. Abraham stops and he hears a noise. And in the thicket behind him, sure enough, a lamp. And Abraham, I must imagine filled with joy, understood so much about God and the way of him being a provider. And he repeats later in this passage, he says, Abraham called the name of that place. He made an altar to God and he called it the Lord will provide. Notice, future tense. Not past tense. Not, not the Lord did provide, but the Lord will provide. This continued faith that ultimately leads to Jesus. John the Baptist, the forerunner for Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How amazing is it that the same moment that most of God's people would be selecting their lambs for the sacrifice, Jesus has arrived as, as their lamb for the sacrifice of of all their sins. And going back to Romans 8, Paul says, He, God the Father, who did not spare His own Son, He let Abraham spare His only Son. But God did not spare His only Son. But He gave Him up for us all. Now consider this, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? And the hope is this, just like Abraham saw, imagine the worship that happened with him and his son and the joy that is expressed, the magnificence of God's provision acknowledged in this moment because of the clarity, because of the perseverance that Abraham expressed in humble obedience and trust, resolving that God would provide and God did provide. And listen, God has provided for us in the same way the sacrifice for our sins. So what's our response? What do we do with all of this as we consider this great Palm Sunday story? Jesus, the Lamb of God, taking the place that we deserved on that altar of death, stepping onto the cross for our sins. Well, if I could go back in time, I'd pull that whole crowd aside knowing what I know now. Chances are I would have been swept up just like the crowd was, sinfully misguided and misunderstood who Jesus really was. But now that I know, if I could go back in time, I would have redirected their Hosanna. I wouldn't have taken the Hosanna away. I would have just redirected the Hosanna. I would have encouraged them to seek Hosanna God's way. And that's my encouraging word for you as we build up to Easter and Good Friday this week. Because these people. They cried Hosanna. That's the right cry. They acknowledged Jesus for who he was. That was the right acknowledgement. And so we should cry Hosanna for healing in our lives, for mended relationships, but we should always want it on God's terms, never on our terms. Sharing with you Psalm 118 verse 25. It's the only place in all the Old Testament that you read this. O Lord, do save we beseech you, which means we beg of you to save. God's provision becomes more clear the more we persevere. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for the story of Palm Sunday and all that we know about you in this story. Uh, how it reveals, God, you're just great and intricate provision of how much you care despite our ability to know what you're up to and what you're doing as we look back long ago at this great story of old, to know how much you care for us and that you will provide for us salvation when we call upon you. But as we live these lives surrounded in brokenness with sin and disease and evil lurking everywhere, Lord, help us to trust in you and continue to cry out Hosanna and to persevere through all of the challenging times and every moment of clarity that we have of the provision that you've made, God, let it be, let it result in worship and honor for your name, not for us, and that it would lead us into greater seasons of trust and dependence and perseverance upon you in Jesus' name. Amen.